I want to start in Proverbs chapter 16, and it's verse 3. And the Word of God says, Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. The word commit in the Bible is interesting. You ever heard of the camel's eye? What happens is when you bring your camel to the city, you have to get it unloaded to get it through the eye. You can imagine big bags on both sides. It won't go through. So you use this word, galah, which means commit. The word, it relates to the camel when it bends its knees and it rolls off its load. So when you're saying that you commit, you're saying you're rolling off your load, you're giving up, you surrender, and you're going to make progress and move forward, right? So there's a lot to the word commit. Of course, a lot of us are carrying some extra baggage. And in order to commit, galah, you need to roll it off, right? Otherwise, you can't make progress. It's going to hold you back. You know, when life doesn't seem fair, when there's this conflict in your heart, causing confusion between the reality that God is there and He's going to help you, it's going to be okay, our spiritual reality. And the reality that we make up in our mind, which is full of lies, and says that we can't make, and it's going to be difficult. If there's confusion and you're having trouble and this conflict arises in your heart, there's trouble there, you haven't really committed to God. One of the wonderful blessings that God gives to us is the idea of free will. He lets you choose. He's created us in His image and His likeness in the sense that you are allowed to make the choices in your life. But some choices aren't always good. There's a great example. Jesus talks about a parable in Luke. We're looking at chapter 15 and starting with verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now here you see that God is saying, you got your choice. If that's what you want, here you go. And not only that, but you're seeing that there's the younger and he wanted his now. Harvard did a study, it's called the Marshmallow Test. It's a great video if you ever get a chance to see it. What they did is they got four-year-olds, they, they sat them down in front of a table, they put a marshmallow in front of them. They said, if you wait and do not eat this marshmallow, we will give you another one. You have two. You find yourself waiting for your marshmallow? Or do you want it now? In our parable, this childlike mind wanted it now. Instant gratification. The me generation. The microwave age. You ever stick a burrito in the microwave where, it clearly says on the package, microwave for one minute, 30 seconds. You put it in for 30 seconds, you check it. All right, it's not ready. Still cold. You check it for another minute. Oh, it's nice and warm. You take a bite, it's cold on the inside. Back in the microwave for another 30 seconds. Finally, you get to the point where, okay, now you got a hot burrito. And guess what? It's so hot, you got to wait. So what you've done is you chopped up a minute and 30 seconds by opening it and checking it and opening it and checking it because you want it now. You want it now. Instant gratification. In that study, they went back 30 years later and checked on these individuals. The ones that waited patiently for the second marshmallow and the ones that did not devour the first marshmallow because they couldn't wait, they did better in their SAT scores, they fared better in their job security, in their lives, and they did better as parents, all the way across the board. So in our parable, the younger says, I want mine and I want it now. He's already got something on his mind. He's young, he's virile, 
and he says in verse 13, And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. He left. It's the same thing as God says, look, you've committed to me, you're a child of God, exercised your faith, show the wisdom that I'm giving to you. And he says, I don't want to go by your rules. I'm excited and I want to go explore and I'm going to another country. I'm going out there to the extreme in gratification. This journey to a far off land is way away from God. It's not near the Father way out there you're not willing to accept any help you got what's yours and you're going out there and you're going on your own and then in verse 14 but he had spent all and there arose a severe famine in the land and then he began to want well now he's at the end of his rope down and out to the curb he got nothing left his spiritual energy tank is run dry not living very well. Verse 15 says, And when he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he was sent to him to feed his swine. This is a Hebrew youngster. He knows the scripture. He was raised around the Bible. He'd been going to the temple. He'd been worshiping God. He knows everything about everything that the ritual system, the Jewish religious system had to offer in terms of forgiveness, in terms of teaching, in terms of wisdom. In fact, he had the Proverbs that we just read. And most likely he read the very same Proverbs. Verse 16 said, And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods of the swine that he ate, and then no one gave him anything. All of a sudden, he had burned all his bridges, Everybody said, oh, you know the Bible, and what are you doing? Look at you. And they all started saying, you liar, you're a schemer, you don't want, I don't want to talk to you. Don't even come near me. Nobody wanted anything to do with him. Why? Because of the choices he made in his life. He decided to make this choice to go away from God, to go out and venture out on his own, to separate himself, he found himself in the worst situation that a Hebrew could ever find himself. So he's sitting there thinking, now the scripture hits him. You ever been there? All of a sudden, the verse comes back to you and you remember, man, there I am again. It's just like, like out there, you're breaking it, you blew it, you're away from God. You're not praying, you're not going to church, you're not doing any of these things, and you're stuck there and you're right back in the filth, slop, pit. Has your life ever looked like a slop pit? 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I'm perishing with hunger? Then he finally comes to himself in verse 18, he says, And I will rise and I'll go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. This is the state of mind that changes. It's that point in your life where you have got to the slop pit, you're broken, you know you can't do it anymore, and you've said to yourself, that's it, I give up, I throw in the towel, I'm going back, I, got, I need Jesus. Some of us haven't been broken to that point. Some of us don't know what I'm talking about. Well, let me explain it to you. I was on literally my deathbed. You think blood coming out of your nose is something? I had blood coming out of my ears. I had blood coming from every opening in my body. When I looked in the mirror, I was crying tears of blood. I literally decided that at that point, my life is over, I'm done. I crawled up underneath of a tree and expected no one to ever find me. I thought to myself, I'm dead. I'm done. It's over. That is what you call broken. It's when you're at the very end of your rope. You've got no place else to look except straight up. I call it the foxhole theory. You 
know, the guy, he's out there in the war, the bullets are flying and there's the bombs going off. He jumps into a foxhole. It's late at night. He falls on his back. He looks up and he sees the stars and he looks at the stars and then, aha, epiphany, the light bulb goes off. God exists. And then he says a simple prayer and he gives, commits his life to Jesus. It's when you're in the battle and when all those bullets are flying, when you're at that moment in your life that you find yourself broken and you give in and you surrender and you say, I give up. God's real. I need him. Admit, believe, and confess. You have to admit that you need Jesus. You have to believe that he's got the ability to solve your situation. If you do not believe that, you're not committing. So the, the light bulb goes off and he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go repent. I'm going back to my father. And then in verse 18, I'll rise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and before heaven. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. You see, there's a, a word there. It's worthy. He got to the point in his life where he felt his life was worthless. And some of us know what I'm talking about because we've had parents that have always treated us like we were worth nothing. They devalued us. The more we tried, the less that we would get credit for anything that we would do. Someone else was always better. You were never good enough. And so you felt in your life, I'm a worthless person. I'm, I, I'm not worthy of grace. It's unbounding love. So when he got the thought, this is what he did, verse 20, he arose and he came to his father, and but when he, he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and fell on his neck and kissed him. And he said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servant, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand. And he said, put some tennis shoes on his feet and give him a blanket and then he said in verse 23 and bring a fatted calf and a bowl of beans and rice <laughs> and let us eat and be merry 24 this is my son who was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found and they began to be merry found yourself lost. You're at the end of your rope. You're broken. What do you do? You turn to Jesus. And at that worst moment in your life, when you feel you're down at the worst circumstances in your life, that's when you grow the closest to God. That's when you feel His presence. That's why we love God so much. He just went out there and wasted it on some prostitutes. He wasted all his money, spent all his money carousing, drinking, uh, working it, not within God's will. What happens when you're not within God's will? Oh, it's a mess. Your life will turn to ashes. I'm not even talking about broken pieces. I'm talking burned up. It's that burning inside that causes us to move out in that kind of direction. To say, you know what? I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I'm going to walk. But it's the same story. It's the same old story in the Garden of Eden. Satan hasn't changed his life. They had everything. They had a beautiful garden. They had the nut all the way through, man. There was nothing that they could have desired except for one thing, and Satan's the one that threw it out there. God's holding out on you. Don't let that lie get you. That's the spirit of discontent. When you're not happy with what God's giving you, God's put you in a certain circumstance. He's trying to teach you something. You're saying, I don't want to learn this lesson. I want to move forward. I want my marshmallow, and I want it now. I don't want to wait for I don't want to learn this part. I don't want to face the issue in my life. I don't want to deal with the circumstances I have to deal with. I don't want to talk to so-and-so. I don't want to write a letter. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to face it. Not facing it is going right back out there to a far off land away from God that's not facing it. God says he's going to reveal things to you in your heart so 
that you can face it so that you'll grow by it, you'll get the tools, you'll learn, and you'll be able to move forward. That's determination. Don't base your determination on assumptions. That's what Eve was doing in the Garden of Eden. She was assuming that God was holding out on her. So she wanted to go and the temptation was there. She wanted her marshmallow. Same lie. Same lie. Satan hasn't changed it. He'll let you have your choices and if you want to make that choice, just like in our parable, you can go off to a far country. Listen very carefully. I want you to understand this. It's very important. You are a child of God. You have accepted Jesus Christ in your life. You're saved. Just because of the fact that you're saved doesn't mean that you're not going to face consequences for your sin. God will place consequences upon your sin. He will bring you to your knees. There are lots of guys getting saved right now in prison and in jail. And I know some of them that have become pastors and set free. And they're good men. If that's what God wants to do, if that's the choice you want to make, that's the route you want to take, that's your choice. God's willing to let you make it. So what's your determination based on? Is it based on assumptions? Are you wasting life on, on just loose living? That's what this prodigal son was doing. He went out there, he went out and lived and lived large. Right? Till the well ran dry. And then he was broken. And then he came back. But doubt is what causes us to disbelieve God. To become discontent with our lives and what God has put for us. And it's our willingness. Or, let's put it around the other way. If it, you are unwilling, that's what this prodigal son was doing. He was unwilling to fall under his heavenly father's arrangement within his house. So because of that, he wanted to make a different choice. That different choice started to lead to his unbelief. His self-worth dropped off the charts. He felt he was no longer worthy. And then he started to condemn himself. That's what Satan wants you to do. That's the lie. God's holding out on you. And then when Satan says, okay, aha, I got you, you're in sin, he drives his nail into you and says, oh, you worthless piece of no good, dirty. You call yourself a Christian and you feel worse. And it's a downward spiral. Don't forget you're a child of God. He's got his robe. The robe is waiting for you. He's going to kiss you on the neck. He'll welcome you back. You come on back. But you have to make that decision. It's a conscious decision. You have to commit to it. You have to say, I'm willing to repent. I know that God forgives. So take it to Him in prayer. Romans 6.23 says, Wages of sin is death. What we're talking about here is spiritual death. You go out into your sin, into your muck and mire, it will drive the Spirit of God so far away from you, you will end up in a spiritual death. It's not that you have lost your salvation. Your, your sins are forgiven once for all time, past, present, future. But you can suffer a spiritual death, and it's all bad. That's not the kind of life God wants for you. You know, and if He wants to, He'll cut your life short just to prove it. So why not turn a tragedy into triumph? Recognize that God loves you so much that He's going to lift your self-worth up off the charts. I mean, He wants you there with Him. Praise Him. Quit looking at things from the outward sense. Object, objectification of self. Anybody ever heard of that one? Objectification of self is when you're always looking at the outside world that's spinning around you and you find yourself always in the center. Let me tell you something, if you put Jesus in the center, the pride goes out the window, right? It's now selfless, not selfish. It's a matter of delayed gratification. It's waiting, let the marshmallow sit. God will bless you with another marshmallow. He'll do it. Because you've been good and you've been faithful. You have the right frame of mind. You're working within God's will. You can make it easy or you can go the rough way around. Sin is not the way to go. 
lot of a lot of it has to do with what's going on in your head. And he says, thoughts. I know the thoughts. God knows what you're thinking. He knows what's going on in your plate. He's got his angels working in the background. They're doing things you can't even begin to imagine. He's putting things together for you. Don't let that opportunity pass. He's all about reconciliation. He's all about love. He's all about bringing us together in the bonds of unity, in his heavenly presence. Everything that God's got for us. Otherwise, it's just burning up as ashes. And I believe that, you know, there in the Garden of Eden, it, the whole deal revolved around pride. Because it wasn't good enough for them. There was this spirit of discontent. Can we be happy with what God gives to us? And then trust in Him.